So welcome to this week's theology study. Uh, we've been dealing with uh, various misunderstandings surrounding the doctrine of election as I'm teaching on the doctrine of election. Today I want to talk about uh, misunderstandings surrounding foreknowledge um, in, as it relates to election. And, and so, as I've said in the past, some people actually say things like um, they believe in foreknowledge but not predestination which is uh, awkward and strange. It's a strange statement to make as both concepts are in the same scripture verse, Romans 8, 29, and interconnected to one another. And, and so there are just a lot of little misunderstandings like that we should clear up. Uh, doctrine is not a smorgasbord of ideas that you just... Uh, skim over or comb over until you find the ones that suit your taste. That's not what doctrine is. Um, it is the teaching of what, doctrine is the teaching of what scripture tells us about God and his ways. Thus, we are simply obligated to what the scriptures teach, not to what we like the best or are the most comfortable with. And I, I think that's important as we look at things like election and foreknowledge and things like that. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people embracing doctrine simply because it's emotionally comfortable for them, not because it's what God actually believes. And, and what you say, well, how do you know what God believes? Well, what does Scripture say? Without spin, without turning it upside down or adding your weird little twist to it, what does Scripture actually say? Now, as we look at that, we come to this understanding, uh, election is not based on God's foreknowledge of our faith. And, and, I, and I want to talk about that. So election is not based on God's foreknowledge of our faith. Some people indicate that God's election is based on a knowledge of the choices that mankind will make. And, and you'll hear that, you know, when people say, well, I believe in foreknowledge. What they're saying, well, I believe God knows who will choose to follow him and who won't. And, and I understand that that's a very comfortable statement for people to make emotionally, but it's not a properly intellectual statement and it's not a properly accurate statement from scripture. Because when, when someone says, well, I believe God uh, chooses those who he knows will choose him. In other words, God knows they will choose him, so he chooses them. That's when you say that out loud, that's kind of odd. Uh, if he sees into the future and sees that they will believe in him, then he predestines them to get saved. And if he sees into the future and sees that they won't believe in him, then he predestines them to be lost. This is a bit convoluted. God must only choose us based on our choice of him. Do we see a problem with that? Where is his omniscience? Where is the infinite wisdom of God in this? Where is his unlimited authority as God? Is, is, is that what is happening? Is God being reduced to a yes man? In this way of thinking, God isn't doing the predetermining at all. If you say, well, he, he, he elects us because we knew we'd choose him, then we're the ones in power, not him. We're, he's honoring our will, and we're not honoring his, which is always the problem of human, humanity. It's the, it's the basis of our confusion. Once again, it's just another way for man to be in charge of his own destiny without regard for God at all. We choose, and God has the great, you know, and, and, and so we choose, and God, as the great cosmic yes man, just agrees with us? No, thank you. I like God as he is. Infinite, sovereign, independently minded from us. That's the God I fell in love with and choose to follow or was chosen to follow. I don't need a bobblehead idol. 
I want the Almighty to be my God. This is often based on a misunderstanding. When people say things like this, it's a misunderstanding of Romans 8, 29, which I referenced earlier. And I'll read it now in the literal translation version. It says this, Because whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, for him to be the firstborn among many brothers. Note this. It is people who are foreknown, not decisions. Right there in the text. It's the people that he foreknows, not their choices. Now that isn't to say God isn't knowledgeable of our choices. But, but we have to understand the distinction. Foreknowledge is of a person, not facts. And so when we look at Romans 8.29, we learn this. It does not speak of God's foreknowledge of the fact that the person would believe in him. It states those whom he foreknew. This indicates a foreknowledge of the person, the individual. This knowledge is personal. It's relational knowledge. It's God looking in the future of certain people and, and seeing that in certain people saving relationships to him. In that sense, he knew them long ago. So God looks in the future and he chooses people to be in a saving relationship with him. That's the foreknowledge. Romans 8.29 says nothing of God knowing the choices that people will make. Now, of course he certainly would since he's omniscient. However, to use this verse to say what people want it to say requires a great deal of spin and speculation. Now the problem is spin makes you theologically dizzy and speculation is highly speculative. We can learn more about this topic from Matthew uh, chapter 7. It's the concept of the never knowns in Matthew chapter 7. And if we were to read those verses, Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, they say this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the person who does what my Father in heaven wants. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we force out demons and do many miracles by the power and authority of your name? Then I will tell them publicly, I've never known you. Get away from me, you evil people. Now, this is Jesus speaking. So we begin to realize what is Je Jesus is God, right? It's fully God. So we, we learn, well, what does God think about all of this? That's the goal of theology. Here we see that God knew facts about these people. He, he knew that they cried, Lord, Lord. He knew about their works or their professed works. He knew they were evil, and he knew that they were lawless. The, in that Greek text there, the lawless is anomia, anti-law. Yet he declares that he had no foreknowledge of them. When he makes the statement, I never knew you. Not I knew you from long ago and knew what you'd choose, or I have always known that you were going to be lawless. That's not what he says. He says, he makes that statement, I never knew you. And this becomes this understanding of the relational knowledge we're talking about when we look at foreknowledge in its relationship to election. Not, And it's not I knew you and forgot you, or I knew you and you walked away, or I knew you and you rebelled. It's none of that. It's I never Knew you. you look up never in original language means never. Clearly here, knowledge of the person is not the same as knowledge about the person. Because the Lord had knowledge about them and yet he declares that he never knew them. So it's the same way when we look at biblical knowledge. It's relational knowledge. And when we look at the text of Romans 8.29, we come to understand this isn't a discussion about knowledge about an individual or facts concerning them. It's, it's a discussion of knowledge of the person to those whom he foreknew. He predestined them to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at this, there are some other odd theologies, and it's always an, 
an attempt for people to retain free will, which is ultimately a humanistic point of view, not a Christian point of view. And I know that will ruffle feathers, but it is reality. It doesn't even appear in church doctrine uh, until, or largely until the Renaissance, which, uh, with Renaissance humanism, which becomes religious humanism, and so on and so forth. Uh, but if we look at this, sometimes people in an attempt to retain free will, which you don't really have, um, say that God elected groups of people, but not individuals to salvation, which is kind of odd in the first place. And so we, we can see that, you know, the age-old discussion between Arminius and, and Calvin, which they never had a discussion because Calvin predates Arminius uh, by by a great deal of time and, and so but the Armenian view says God elected the church as a group well we know the church is the Lord's bride but that's not at all what these passages are discussing it's they're discussing individuals and and the Swiss theologian Karl Barth said that God elected Christ and all people are elected in Christ um, those that's spin and that's what it is it's spin it's just twisting scripture to make a statement that you're comfortable with. And, and what we realize, this is not what Romans 8.29 actually says. It, Romans 8.29 indicates that certain people were foreknown by God. And this is in agreement with Matthew 7, that certain people were never known. And so we see those groups, the foreknowns and the never knowns. This isn't about facts or knowledge of the individual but it's knowledge with the individual in relationship. Neither of these scriptures is discussing groups of people, but individuals. This is just another vain attempt to give man an authority of choice that really belongs to God Almighty. It seems a little like idolatry when you say it like that. So herein is the ultimate issue. Man's unwillingness to leave his destiny to God. That's the problem. When we deal with the doctrine of election, the doctrine of foreknowledge, as part of the doctrine of election even, when we look at that, what we find in the resistance of people against it theologically is man's unwillingness to leave the choice of his destiny to God. Our longing for independence in choosing our eternal direction. What people don't realize is that that is part of our fallen nature. It's not part of our redeemed nature. Eve was tempted to replace God in authority, thus choosing to eat the forbidden fruit. And that's what she, you'll be as gods if you taste of the fruit. Then she examines it. She looks at it and she decides it's good for food and etc. And, she, and that it could make her wise. So she eats the forbidden fruit. And, and people often resist the idea that God has authority over them. We tend to think that God only has the authority we give him, which is really deceptive. That The, the enemy is in that. But if that were the case, God wouldn't be God at all. If God only has the authority you give him, then he's not really God. If, if, when people say, well, you need to make him your God, I got news for you. He's your God, whether you submit to him or not. You know, the, the atheist says, well, I don't believe in God. God is his God, too, because God's the one who determines his eternal direction. You know, the, that whole discussion people have about, well, my higher power is this and my higher power is that. God is everybody's higher power. And, and that's why the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, because there will be a day of reckoning, the final judgment. Emotional reasoning is not how you come to tr the truth of what God believes about himself. And that, I like that statement, even though it's mine. I, I still like it. Emotional reason, reasoning is not how you'd come to the truth of, how, of what God believes about himself. 
And, and learning what God believes about himself is the ultimate goal of theology. That's what we're in this for, to learn what God believes about himself. I don't care what you believe about God. I don't care what someone down the street believes about God. I don't care what Arminius or Karl Barth believed about God. I'm interested to know what God believed about God. We discover a great deal of that when we look at the words of Jesus. And, and here's what I've come to notice in Scripture. God believes in his sovereignty. God believes in his sovereignty and authority over creation more than he believes in your independence. And, and in fact, he showed that to Adam and Eve. That when they asserted an independence from the commandments of God, God showed up and asserted his authority over them which stay, shows us that he believes in his sovereignty more than our independence to make upper story choices. Well, that's it for now. Amen, and the Lord bless you. Next time, we will consider the fact that Scripture doesn't indicate that God elected us because of our faith. While we're saved by faith, it isn't because of our faith that we're chosen. And that's next week. Lord bless you. We'll see you then.